Well, anyway, good morning. If you haven't met yet or you haven't picked up on it, my name's Rob. I'm the youth pastor uh, from Northview. Super excited to have all of you joining with us this morning. I'm just curious, by raise of hands, who scored a Krispy Kreme donut this morning? Yeah, delightful. I apologize. They were fresh yesterday, but they're still good today. Uh, enjoy it. We have more stuff to give away as the day goes on, too. So we're going to take this next little bit of time here this morning. I know we might be a little bit tired. We were up late having fun. I know that because I heard you up late having fun. Uh, that's all right. Uh, we had a big breakfast, and now we're here. A couple of us are sliding to a Krispy Kreme coma a little bit. But we're going to continue our study of Peter. Uh, we're going to set aside a little bit of time to look at another aspect of the life of Peter and hopefully continue to learn from him. And learn what life with Jesus can look like. Uh, if we're using the lingo of the weekend, which I promise, yes, I like a good pun. We won't use it too many times this weekend. Uh, but we're hoping to learn really how to advance our relationship with Jesus. As well as uh, advance our relationships with one another. And I hope you guys get an opportunity to do that. In fact, I really want to challenge you uh, throughout the day today, especially at mealtimes, sit with some new people. Make some new friends. A lot of us, myself included, gravitate towards the same people that we came with. But those are people I get to see all the time. I want to meet others of you. So let's, let's keep mixing up. Let's keep developing some new relationships. And that's really the heart of this weekend. The heart of this weekend uh, and using Peter as our case study is for us to learn what advancing our relationship with Jesus looks like. And what it looks like to be entering into a relationship with one another and following Jesus together. And I hope uh, that the Apostle Peter continues to be an encouragement to you in your own life. And that you have time throughout the weekend to, to ask questions and draw closer to Jesus through all of it. We're going to have a lot of fun today. We're going to get to that later. Uh, but even in the fun, look for ways to ask questions. Look for ways to be diving in deeper with Jesus. And so this morning, we're diving right back into the life of Peter. We talked last night uh, about Peter being called. That was the key word last night, was Peter being called through this invitation uh, from his brother. And then Jesus recruiting Peter onto his ministry team. And we're going to look this morning at a specific interaction between Peter and Jesus. And I'll be honest, it was, it was hard to pick just one, but we, we picked one. And this interaction is all part of Peter being shaped by Jesus. So our key word this morning is Peter was shaped. And we're going to look and see what did a one-on-one -on -one time between Jesus and Peter look like. So last night, Peter being called by Jesus. And now what we have is the, the continuation of that. of Jesus really intentionally molding, teaching, growing, and shaping Peter. And what Jesus is doing is he's, he's desiring to make Peter not just into a disciple for the three years of ministry that Jesus has before he dies on the cross, but to be a lifelong disciple of Jesus. And to really be an example for other believers, even us today. Here we are talking about Peter. So Jesus' plan worked. What does it look like to be a lifelong disciple of Jesus? And that's all part of what Jesus is pouring into the life of Peter. He's also shaping Peter for future ministry leadership. Although Peter doesn't know it yet. Remember, Peter hears a lot. Peter's taught a lot. It takes him, like us, many times until he's getting it right. But Peter is being shaped to be an example to the church as well as to lead the church. So Peter is being shaped. What Jesus is doing is he's, he's going to take the rough parts of Peter. His, his reactiveness, his quickness to action. We said Peter was someone that, that acted first and then not even thought second, like thought maybe or at some point. Uh, but Peter is being actively shaped by Jesus, not to be a better Peter, but to be the Peter that Jesus needs him to be. Has anybody in here ever worked with metal? With metal. All right, so there's this thing that happens when you're working with metal. Uh, a metal just starts with just raw material. And it's, it's unrefined, it's unperfected, and what it takes to, to refine those things are three things. Heat, pressure, and time. And through the use of those things, this metalsmith removes impurities and he shapes metal into something valuable, into something precious, into something useful. 
And the same is happening to Peter during his time with Jesus. He's being refined. The impurities of Peter are being removed, and Peter himself is being refined into something useful for the kingdom of God. At this point in Peter's story, he had already left what he had known. He grew up uh, in a fishing community. He was a professional fisherman, uh, and he was being trained to bring others into the kingdom of God, or to use the lingo of Jesus. He, he's taking Peter from being a fisherman to being a fisher for men. He responded to Jesus' call to follow and is learning from the Messiah directly. This idea of being shaped is nothing new for Peter. Because to become the level of fisherman that he was, he would have had to been instructed by others who know the trade better than him. Others who poured into Peter, who taught him what to do, how to read the water, the weather, to understand the life cycle of fish, all of these different things. Peter had been shaped into becoming a professional fisherman. And now he's living with Jesus, he's ministering alongside Jesus, he's hearing the teachings of Jesus firsthand, what should absolutely be crazy to us when we read Jesus' teaching, we're reading the written word, Peter was hearing that spoken. So he's involved one-on-one -on -one in these, he's experiencing in the incredible works that we read about Jesus doing, Peter is seeing lay men walk, Peter is seeing people's disabilities restored, Peter is experiencing all of this firsthand, and it's helping him grow Peter into something more than he was before. Peter is demonstrating, even 2,000 years later, to us sitting here at camp, what obedience and willingness look like. Obedience in the sense of responding to the call of Jesus. Responding to the call to follow and to stay and to be taught. And willingness to allow growth to even take place. It would be one thing for Peter to follow, and then as Jesus is teaching for Peter to be like, I don't want to change, I'm just here to check out the side show. But he's demonstrating a willingness to learn. He's like, I'm recognizing who this Jesus person is, this Messiah, this Savior. He knows something that I don't, and I want him to teach me. And what we see as we study the life of Peter, which in a lot of ways reflects our own life, is that this willingness to grow takes place through Peter being taught but oftentimes, Peter being corrected. And we're going to see in today's story, Peter is still very reactionary. Peter just does. He still has the same mindset as when Jesus first called him and said, Hey, I want you to follow me. And he leaves everything and he follows Jesus. He just does. What we're going to see this morning is that Peter continues that, but it's all directed in his pursuit of Jesus. So if you have your Bible uh, with me, we're going to read a story uh, about Peter and Jesus. Now, the, the other disciples are part of this, but we're really going to focus in on there's one part of the story that is a specific interaction between Jesus and Peter, where Peter is coached, corrected, really, one-on-one. -on -one. And then we're going to go through a practical exercise together. All right, we're going to get our minds working, too. So go ahead, Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. I'll read it for us. And this is one of those stories, if you've grown up in church... This is probably a story that you've heard before. And I know I am guilty of this. When I hear stories, I'm like, oh, I've read that before. I don't really go into the mindset of like, maybe, maybe the Lord will speak to me in a new way. I go into a mindset of like, I've heard this, I can check out for a couple minutes. Let's not do that. Let's see if we can learn something new. So Matthew 14, 22 to 33. This is following Jesus feeding the 5,000. It says, immediately he, Jesus, made the disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. By the way, we're going to talk about prayer a little bit. Jesus took time away from ministry to seek, to seek his Father's heart through prayer. If Jesus is praying, we should too. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he, Jesus, came to them, walking on the sea. So, let's set the stage real quick. The disciples have just experienced an incredible miracle. Jesus feeding thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. He tells them, okay, get in the boat, head on over to the side. I'll see you in a little bit. And they're like, okay, cool. Don't know why you're not coming with us, but we'll go. And they, they start going in. In the middle of the night, the storm picks up. And in the middle of the storm, as the disciples are like, man, what are we doing? Luckily, 
God's provision. They have some fishermen with them that probably know how to sail and navigate in the midst of a storm. They look out. And they see Jesus walking on the water. Now, we're here at a lake, and some of us have rooms that when you woke up this morning, you looked and you're like, man, what a great view to wake up to. And it's like, yeah, it's raining, but it's relatively calm and still outside. What would our reaction be if we saw someone walking on the water? And here they are in the midst of a storm. So I think in verse 26, their reaction is appropriate. But when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. Like, oh my goodness, what is that? Like, terrified, 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 terrified. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now really, the story could end there, and it's an incredible story, and it's powerful, and we can look to what it means to trust in God in crazy situations, but stories that involve Peter don't usually stop right there. Because it continues. remember, Peter, what does Peter do? Peter does, right? And so it shouldn't surprise us in verse 28 when it starts, and Peter, it's like, of course, if someone's going to speak up, it's Peter. And Peter answered him. So this is Jesus saying, hey, it's me. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. I wonder what the other disciples were thinking. They go from, it's a ghost, to maybe it's Jesus, because even Peter has thrown that if word in there, if it's you. And Peter's like, Jesus, is, if it's you, if it's you walking on the water in the middle of the storm, we're pretty sure it's not. It might be a ghost. I don't know. But if it's you, tell me to come out, and I'm going to come out to you on the water. And Andrew, his brother, is like, I'm so dead at home. I introduced my brother to this guy, and now I'm going to have to go home and say Peter jumped out of the boat. And, oh. and Jesus says, come. And again, so Peter got out of the boat. He got out and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Again, incredible story for in there. Peter says, Jesus, if it's you, I will come. Jesus says, come on out. Peter says, okay, and steps out of the boat. Okay? I don't know if you've been in stormy water before, but the idea of getting out of a boat when there's big rollers around you, absolutely terrifying. But Peter's eyes are fixed on Jesus, and what happens in that moment is he is like Jesus, walking on the water and walks to his Savior. Man, how cool would it be if, if the story ended there, be like, man, Peter has incredible faith. This guy is awesome. And then one of, the, one, of, one of the biggest words in Scripture is the word but. Because you know something's changing. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And, begin, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. What happens is Peter is walking on the water and his attention shifts. He realizes, I'm walking on water in the middle of the storm, and he begins to sink and cries out the only thing he can, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? This one-on-one -on -one discipleship moment on the water in the middle of a storm, between Jesus and Peter. And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So in this story, we experience Jesus walking on water, something in itself that's absolutely incredible, absolutely mind-blowing. Truly, we can see just in that part of the story, this is God at work exercising his incredible power over nature. Very understandably, when the disciples saw Jesus walking, they were terrified. Can you imagine what might have been going through their heads? And yet here we see Peter in his classic reactiveness once again. Out of everyone in the boat, it's Peter, the only one who not only responds verbally in affirmation of who Jesus is claiming to be, but then does something about it. He gets out of the boat and he walks on the water. I just want like the mind trip for the rest of the disciples also. Like, it's a ghost, it's Jesus, Peter's talking, where's Peter going? Peter's walking also. Like, this absolutely incredible moment. Until Peter took his eyes off Jesus. At which point he begins to drown in the midst of the sea. And he's saved by Jesus. And in this, in this moment, 
In the middle of the storm, Jesus asks Peter, why did you doubt? In this moment, Jesus is providing one-on-one mentorship to Peter. Even in the midst of this crazy storm, Jesus asks Peter why he doubted. Peter is being taught right here. Peter is being an example to us right here of the importance of keeping his eyes on Jesus at all times, no matter what is happening around him. Peter is also learning about the power of responding to obedience that Jesus is asking us to step out of faith and what faith, that faith is all about taking that next step, even if it's into the unknown and relying on Jesus for everything. Jesus is teaching Peter the power of fear. Jesus is teaching Peter the power of worry, the power of doubt, but also the power of faith. And Jesus is demonstrating to Peter what it's like to put your full trust in God. So when Jesus asks Peter why he doubts, Jesus is asking Peter if Peter actually trusts him. And if Peter has placed his faith above everything else in Jesus. Now, this story for, you know, the scheme of a lot of things is is quick and it's a personal moment between Jesus and Peter, but it serves as a powerful reminder to all of us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. To allow him to be the center of our attention and and that we need to respond to the obedience that he is calling out to us to respond in and constantly trust in him no matter what is happening around us. And we say things like that, like, yes, no matter what is happening, I'll keep my eyes on Jesus. And what that means is no matter what the culture is saying about what it means to be a follower of Christ, you keep your eyes on Jesus. No matter what your friends at school are encouraging you to do, you keep your eyes on Jesus. No matter what social media is telling you is cool and popular and trendy, you keep your eyes on Jesus. No matter when others are questioning our allegiance in Jesus, wondering, what we stand for, why are we a part of this, no matter what happens, we're to keep Jesus at the center of everything. And we're to look to him always. Peter was being shaped by Jesus for future ministry. Ministry in which Peter would need to either trust Jesus or fall victim to fear and sink once again without Jesus physically there to save him in that moment. It's crazy to think that in this time of walking on water and sinking in the storm, this might not even be the craziest situation that Peter's involved in in his life. And it's not. Yet I bet he never forgot what Jesus was teaching in this moment. And Jesus shapes us as well. To help us learn about what it means to be steadfast in him, no matter what storm of life we may be in. We either trust in Jesus and rise through the storm with him, or we look away and like Peter, we begin to sink. This story is not alone in the times that Jesus spoke directly to Peter regardless of who else was around, yet it helps to get a glimpse into what Jesus was trying to teach Peter and how he's trying to shape us. Jesus had a clear path for Peter, and this is clear from their very first interaction when Jesus calls Peter into ministry with him to be discipled, to be the rock of the Christian church. But Jesus also knew Peter wasn't ready that there were tasks ahead, that there was a plan ahead, and Peter wasn't quite there yet. Like unrefined metal, Peter needed to be shaped, he needed to be refined into something useful for the kingdom of God. You see, Peter made a pretty decent Peter, but he made it pretty lousy, Jesus. And Jesus needed to spend time with him to teach him, to shape him, to be less like Peter the fisherman, and to be more like Jesus, his Messiah. Jesus had called Peter to follow him. He had called Peter into a personal relationship with him, but that was just the beginning. The shaping of Peter took years to make him more like Jesus, to take those attributes that we associate with Peter being quick-tempered, of being hot-headed, of being reactionary, and make those same skills useful for the kingdom of God. Not to remove remove Peter's reactive tendencies because the more we study the life of Peter, we realize those tendencies never go away, but to shape them, to direct them 
for use in a manner that is honoring to God and brings others into an understanding of who Jesus is. We're going to take a turn. And we're going we're gonna to go through a little personal activity that I think will help us understand this idea of Jesus shaping Peter even more. On the back of your notes, you're going to see a weird-looking group of symbols. All right? It's up there on the screen as well. Uh, if you don't have a pen, I've got a couple up here. You're going to need one, and there are some uh, in the back as well, so you're welcome to grab one of those. They're right there on the stage. All right, we're going to fill this thing out together. We're going to see what in the world does this have to do with being shaped. To start off, uh, in the middle of the triangle, there you can see there's a line kind of all by itself. This, this triangle, for the purpose of the next few minutes, this triangle is your life. And so on that line in the middle of your triangle, I want you to write your name. Just so you have a reference point of what all, of it, what, what all is going on here. So your, your triangle, which even using like that language, I feel like some like weird motivational speaker that's like making interesting connections to things. Your triangle, your inner triangle, but it's just a shape, it's just for illustrative purposes, it's all good. Uh, you're really shaped, your life is shaped, if we had to summarize it into three categories, by experiences, environments, and ethics, or your beliefs. And we're gonna label each side of the triangle with one of those, those words on the long, I don't know, Man, math was so long ago for me. On the, this part of the triangle, I don't know, on the outside perimeter, you're going to label experiences on one, environment on another, and ethics on another. And I want you to think about this. When you think about uh, experiences, think about the things that you've been through in your life. Both the good and the bad, because both have shaped who you are today. Your environment is the area around you, the places that you grew up the kind of family you were brought into, the school you attended, the places that you are. And last, the ethics side. This is your, if you want another fancier word, your personal ethos or your personal beliefs or convictions. These are the things that you hold to be true and the driving forces behind your life. And hopefully if you are a follower of Jesus, your, your ethics line are the same as his and his desire for you. So once you have those down, now we can see uh, the three lines on the inside of the triangle. Those are the... Whoa. Who are your jets, bro? No! And ethos, or ethics. Ethics. Are we good? I'm scared. Alright, so to start things off, on the line in the middle, you're going to write your name. All right, it's all right, we'll catch up. If you, need, if you need time, you just let me know. All right, so these three areas impact three specific parts of your life, and that's gonna be the inside parts of that triangle. The first is your thoughts. What goes on inside your mind? As they're the main feeders, as these three really feed and in your mind. I know it's small, it's all right. So the line, the angle line inside the triangle. Zach Stoppin. Where did the experiences ethics? On the outside of the triangle. Like this? Yes. Oh. And now, now we're on the three inside lines. Three inside triangles. Nope. Three inside triangles. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so what are these? Thoughts. The first one is thoughts. Thoughts. That's as far as we've gotten. Okay. We're all caught up now. All right, I know it's confusing. That's right, I believe in you. You're like, we didn't come here to go to school. <laughs> All right, so we have thoughts, the things that are going on inside our mind. The second area is your speech. The words that you say that are a reflection of your mind and your heart, as well as uh, your language and the other parts uh, that you connect to words. So that's now in the, I like whoever said the mini triangle inside the big triangle, we're just gonna go with that, okay? So the second mini triangle inside the triangle is your speech. And the third is your behavior, your actions. So all three of these, thoughts, speech, and behavior, are influenced by the three shaping categories, experience, environment, and ethics. And in the middle is your name. Are we okay to move on to the next part? Are you good? All right, awesome. All right, so now we're going to move outside because here's the thing is 
You don't live in a vacuum. Yes, we have these various parts that shape who you are, but they are in turn impacted, and so, so therefore, so are you, by the influence of others. And we've all been influenced and shaped by others, and that's where these other squares and circles are gonna come into play. So we're gonna start labeling them and filling them in. Labeling, don't write inside it, right next to it or on top of it, because then we're gonna put something inside each of those, all right? The f I'm so nervous now to explain it. <laughs> so, in the top left, my wife makes fun of me sometimes. Does anybody else sometimes forget their left and their right? And you're like, they're like, make an L, and then you look at it and you're like, which one's an L? I don't know, like this is part of the problem. All right, so the top left. All right, we good? All right. No? Go, go, Zach, go. Okay, top left. Boom! On top of it or next to it, you're going to write early childhood. Or, or early if you want to just summarize it, or childhood. You can write childhood too. All right. And now in the square, you're going to write the names of a couple people. You, now, these, this, is, this is a time you probably don't remember this time. We're kind of looking at like the zero to five age gap right now. So you're like, not, maybe not your strongest memories. But I want you to write the names of a couple people who influenced you at this stage of life. Or maybe who you're like, that person probably did. Go ahead and just write just a couple names inside the square. Yep. Oh, perfect. Inside the square. All right. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person next to you and I want you to share one name from inside that square from your early childhood and why you put them down as somebody who impacted you. You have 30 seconds, go. Turn to the person next to you and share one of the names that you wrote in there and why. Do we have more papers floating around? Oh, there's some right here on the front. Right there. All right, so now we're going to move on to the second square. Oh, we don't have enough time to share. Hey, we got all weekend. So now, Zach, you can pick, pick which square we go to next. Top right. Top right. All right, now we're moving to that square. That's elementary. Uh, bar of your friend. Elementary. And so you're going to write a couple names of people that impacted your life during those elementary years. All right? E-L-E-M-E-N-T-A-R-Y. You're welcome. What? I can't hear you. you uh, as many as you want. Well, it's still elementary time, so. <laughs> I don't think you were in elementary long. Well, all right, so now you're gonna share what you're doing. I don't want you to share with somebody next to you. So go ahead and turn kind of every other row, someone either in front or behind you, and share one name with them. You're gonna have to figure it out, be creative. during middle school years, and now here's what we're gonna do. If you're on this side of the room, you need to share with someone who's over there, and vice versa. So get up, find someone on the other side of the room, and share a name or two of people during middle school. You can wait a second and write down names, it's okay, I, I apologize. 
No. No. What? All right, now go. All right, middle school. Somebody on the other side, get up and go. North, you lead the charge. Hey, go, 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 go. Hey, North East Brew, let's go. couple names of people who have been impactful or are being impactful in this current season of life. I'll throw a period and a pause there. Yeah. And now go find someone that works in the kitchen and tell them. Uh, all right, once you have a couple people, go ahead and you're going to get up again, find someone you haven't talked to yet this weekend, and tell them a couple of those people. Go. When you're done, not, not to rush you. Someone that's been influential in high school. Uh, I had a couple buddies. My youth pastor was definitely on there. Awesome. Uh, yeah, my buddies. I had a couple buddies that were influential because they got arrested. My buddies got arrested in high school. Oh, wow. Just making sure. Oh, I was about to do that. You could. All right, once you share with someone, go ahead and grab a seat. All right, we're going to move on to the circles. All right, now it's time for the circle. The circle that Zach is pointing to. I want you to label this one the next five. So the next five, that's what, not like the next five circles, but this is the, the next five or, or five plus or just five, be creative. Because what this is representing, the, the two circles are going to be future seasons of life. And so we got to do a little forward thinking. I believe in you. So this first circle, this future five, for some of you, this is going to be the college years. But I also know that not everybody is going to go to college, at least not like a traditional college. So I just want you to think about the next five, the, the five years of your life after high school. All right. So that whatever your graduating year was is and the next five. And I want you to put in that circle the names of a couple of people or types of people who you think will be an influence on your life in the five years after high school. You might not know their names directly because it's in the future and you haven't met them, but types of people. Hmm? Then put them down. If you've met them, put them down. If you think they will, be. And then the second circle 
Sure. <laughs> and the next circle is really the all-encompassing, you can label it however you want, but it's, it's those, after those five years, we're moving forward. So that's kind of the after college, maybe young adult life, Zach just said the next 20, whatever you want to label it. And who could be influential now that you're in that season of life? Yeah, Dave, thank you very much. I know you got my back all day. That's good, Dan. I like that, all day. So in the last circle, it's that after college and onward. Mentally. All right, I'm curious. I want to hear from just one or two people at first. Uh, that first five-year circle. Who is who is somebody? I just found money in my pocket. Cool. Uh, who is who is somebody, either by name or or type of person that you put in that next five years bucket? College roommate. Yeah, that's huge. Future spouse in the next five years. I like it. You must be going to college Bible school. Ready to guys like each other. Your wife? Man, I love the optimism of five years after high school, getting married, ring by spring. Good luck, boys. All right, in the very back. Hey, I know that my group in Northview has your back because they're being really quiet so I can hear you. What did you say? Your mom? Awesome. Yeah. Your partner? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, last one. Zach. Oh, uh, you know the donuts are all gone, right? So. All right, what about, what about that next circle, that, that five and beyond into the future? Spiritual mentors, nice. Well, each other. Yeah, I'm not really friends with anyone I went to high school with, so good luck. Just kidding. Coworkers, yeah. Your friends? Yeah, I like coworkers. I spend more time with my coworkers than I do my family, so. Yeah. Hang on, hang on. What? One more time. Family. It's all in. What about from this side of the room? That five plus years category. Who do we put on that? Family. College professors. Yeah. Small group friends. Absolutely. Hey, I love it. So, what we can see through this this little exercise and. I encourage you to share with other people. Now we've got a great icebreaker. Who'd you put in your fourth square? Uh, and then you'll be like, what first fourth square? Then you find Zach to point it out for you. It'll be great. Uh, but what we've seen is there's many people who have either shaped us into who we are today. All right, let's bring it back in. We can share. Let's share afterwards. That sounds fun. But we can see that there's people who have, who have shaped us from birth to now, and then we recognize at least that there are people, if we don't know who they are directly, that will continue to shape us. Now, I have a bet, and it might not be true for you, but I know when I first went through this exercise myself, this was true, so I bet it is for many of us, I think that we put people down who influenced us in what we would perceive to be a positive manner. But we also need to be aware of those negative or bad influences and that those people in those circumstances are still an influence and an impact on our lives today. And they still affect how we've been shaped. The problem is we, we look at these names and if we rely just on the people on the page in front of you, you're going to fall short. You're going to miss the full opportunity, the full potential of what Jesus has planned for you because greater than anyone on this list is we need to be shaped by Jesus. When we look at the names on our diagram, I wonder, where is Jesus? Did we put him on there? Should we have put him on there? Well, if these people are influencing our environment and experiences and ethics, which then impact our speech, thoughts, and behaviors, then Jesus absolutely needs to be on our diagram, as do the people who influence behavior on behalf of Jesus and encourage him to follow his ways over the ways of the world. Peter had been shaped by a variety of people in his fishing career. And now we're seeing in the story, Jesus is shaping him for something more, and the same is true for us. 
On our own, we're like Peter, especially Peter at the start where we're a little rough around the edges, a little lost without a proper guide, just going through the motions. And we need someone who can see the full vision, the full trail before us, who can lead us. We need Jesus to take who we are and refine it. We need Jesus to shape us. We need to give Jesus authority and influence, both of which are key to allowing him to shape us. Authority in the sense that Jesus needs to be on the throne of our lives and influence in what, and, and that we need to be listening to his voice first and foremost in every area of our life. The Bible teaches us, plain and simple, that we're all sinners, that all of us have fallen short and lost, and that we need Jesus to be our Savior, to be our shepherd, to be our teacher, and that we need him to refine us to be more like him in every way, in every area of our lives. And thankfully, like we talked about last night, the Bible tells us that the invitation invitation to join the Jesus movement is open to everybody. And that it starts, as Paul writes in Romans, it starts with confessing Jesus as Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. And from there, we allow the spirit of God to change us to be more like him and less like our fallen selves. You see, Jesus called Peter to follow him, but that was just the beginning. Jesus calls us to follow him, but that is just the beginning of a relationship with him. Christianity is not a faith of being passive. It's absolutely critical. It's a starting point to answer the call of Jesus before you to step into a relationship with him. But that's not enough. That's not the full picture. Realize we need time spent with Jesus to allow him to shape us, to mold us, to change us, to transform us. There's a call to follow Peter's example, to understand who Jesus is as the Messiah and respond accordingly. We've seen Peter called and now he is in this process of being shaped and so must we. We witness all throughout the Bible that both big moments as well as intentional one-on-one discipleship trained Peter, shaped him, influenced, and he was grown by Jesus through both of those. Even in the chapter that we read, we have Peter experiencing Jesus feeding thousands of people from nothing, then Jesus walking on water, and Jesus interacting with Peter one-on-one in that situation. We have huge situations, huge things that Jesus is doing, as well as one-on-one training. Both are impacting and influencing Peter. And it started with Peter's obedience. It started with Peter following, and now it's his willingness to allow Jesus to shape him, which involves being taught. It involves being corrected. It involves being encouraged. And in Peter's life, like mine many times, it comes with even being rebuked. But it's all centered in Jesus desiring to see Peter transformed into something more, taking the rough Peter and shaping him into an incredible tool for the kingdom of God. So how do we do this? How do we allow Jesus to be our primary authority and influence in our lives? Well, I have four action steps that we can take to put all of this into application. The first is study the scriptures to better know the heart of Jesus. And study others who have followed Jesus to see Jesus leading them and what encouragement they even have for us today. Like we're doing here with studying the Bible and studying the life of Peter. This means spending time in the Word of God, spending time in our Bible, and it's okay to start small. I know for some of us, reading is not on our list of interests. And the thought of sitting down and being told, okay, go read this book, I don't even know where to begin or what to do, just start small. Jesus desires your obedience. Spend time with Him in His Word. The key is to start. And to enter in with a heart of seeking to better understand Jesus and his way. The second is to seek the Lord in prayer. To talk to Jesus. And ask him to shape every part of you. A personal relationship needs communication. And this is true for our lives with Jesus as well. Jesus, creator God, the Messiah, wants to hear from you. He wants you to reach out to him. He wants you to seek him. This includes spending time in prayer, talking to Jesus, but there's two parts that come in communication. 
And it also means spending time in silence to allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. To allow the opportunity of the Spirit to engage with your life because communication goes both ways. Third, like we're doing this weekend, be engaged with community who will point you back to Jesus. Who will encourage you in your faith and will even back up what the Bible teaches through their own actions, through their own words. And allow them to be an influence in your life in a loving, Jesus-reflecting manner. This may mean shifting your friend group. Or at least those at the core that you consider to be your core group, your, your inner circle, as my friends and I call it. This may mean shifting to people that are following Jesus who can be an encouragement to you in your own faith. Who can be that reflection of Jesus' nature. You see, Jesus designed us for community. It's a reflection of of his relationship within the, in, within the Trinity, and he wants you to be connected with people that will encourage and build and grow that relationship with one another. And fourth is seek mentorship. That could be from your parents, your teachers, leaders, youth pastors, but people who are further along in their walk with Jesus, and even just further along in life who can help you see through and navigate storms, people who can teach you, encourage you, pray for you, correct you, and people who want to see you shaped to be more like Jesus. You have a great group of leaders available to you this weekend. Take advantage of the time, not just here, but moving forward as you're doing life together. Go to your leaders and say, hey, I love what you're doing with us as a group. Can I get some one-on-one time? Because there's just ways that I need to better see Jesus and be like him. That's why we do what we do. Your leaders are here. Your leaders pour their time and their energy. They take this weekend, they take nights, they take weeks away from their families because they want you to be more like Jesus. Take advantage of that time. Now, this is not simply a one-time fix-all approach, but this is a lifelong process. If you want the, the graduate school word, the word is sanctification. To follow Jesus your entire life. To allow him to continuously shape you to be more like him. To do this well, we need to examine and determine what the influences are in our lives. And if they're pointing us towards Jesus or away from Jesus. Because the truth is, there's no middle ground. And this will require adjustments of who or what we're allowing to shape us. If someone or something is not pointing you to Jesus in his word and his way, then it is pushing you away from him. A key to a lot of this, if we had to think of one attribute that we need to embody in order to go through this process being shaped, it's the word humility. Admitting that we don't know it all. And that we need Jesus to speak into our lives. That we need others who are further along in a walk with him to speak into our lives. Provide instruction and correction. Because the truth is, we don't know it all. But we're surrounded by people who want to seek Jesus together. I like to call the worship team to come back up is they're going to they're going to close for us tonight we get to again take advantage of a time together and i want you to take advantage of this this whole weekend allowing your leaders to speak biblical truth into your lives to pray for you to come alongside you and to help you see jesus through everything that's going on i want you to use this weekend as a time where jesus continues to shape you to refine you to purify you to sanctify you As we worship and we we think through the exercise that we did of of writing out people, give thanks to the Lord for the people he's put in your life. And allow Jesus even more influence and authority in your life than ever before. Like Peter, allow Jesus to shape you so that when the storms of life come, because they will, you can stand firm with your eyes fixed on Jesus. With your faith fully rooted in him. And it starts with obedience to the call and a willingness to be shaped. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together. And Lord, as we have a time to worship now, I pray that we turn to songs of thanksgiving for the way that you impact each of our lives, for the people you've placed before us, Lord, and the fact that you want a relationship with us, that you desire to to change us, to transform us, and to shape us. I thank you again for the example of Peter of being shaped by you, And may we see, Lord, that you don't give up on us. 
that you're willing to come into our lives and work alongside us. May we allow you to do so. May you be with us this morning as we worship in your son's name.